Hello, uh, I'm Matt Kofroth, Watershed Specialist for the Lancaster County Conservation District. And this is uh, one in a series of uh, training manuals or training videos in regards to the Water Quality Volunteer Coalition. Uh, this one is on uh, macro vertebrate sampling or biological assessments of a stream. And will be basically a, a PowerPoint with me uh, talking through that in regards to how to do the macro sampling and then also some of the macro invertebrates uh, that you might be finding in the stream and what they might mean water quality wise along with adaptations. So uh, we'll get into it and uh, go from there. So, this is macro invertebrates uh, taking a look at their, our future. And the, the reason we named it this way is basically talking about um, this ma these macro invertebrates are a way of telling the water quality future of that particular stream or the water quality uh, uh, presently of that stream. Water macro invertebrates are really the indicators that the state uses and others when it comes to water quality standards. So by looking at these critters, we can tell quite a bit in regards to the water quality, because we can tell if the, the stream is good, bad, or, or kind of indifferent by looking at these critters. Uh, very similar to what we do chemistry-wise and habitat-wise, but macroinvertebrates seem to be the telltale indicators of really telling the overall water quality story. And that's really what we're trying to get across here at this point. <clears throat> so macroinvertebrate sampling is, is basically looking at the benthic invertebrates or benthic community of a particular stream looking what's on the bottom, what's living there 24 seven, 365, because they're the ones that aren't moving in the stream. They're the ones living there uh, the, their entire lives. And they're the ones really dealing with the pollution, the sediment issues, the other things coming down the stream and really being affected by that. So they're a really good indicator for the particular stream. Most of these critters we'll talk about, but you can see them here on the screen stream, excuse me, the screen, and these will actually, uh, we'll talk about individual characteristics for each one of these, but each one of these are, are typically living in the stream for anywhere from one to five years, getting bigger, and then eventually emerging as adults, and we'll go into that. So what are macroinvertebrates for a bi biological assessment? They're aquatic insects that are large enough, you can see with your naked eye, but have no backbone. Um, they're really water quality indicators is really what it comes down to. Uh, I've, when I teach this for kids, we always tell kids, everybody knows what a caterpillar is. It turns into a butterfly. Picture these, these aquatic insects kind of like the aquatic insects of the stream, where they're living in the stream anywhere from one to five years, getting bigger and bigger and bigger for that one day they'll actually come out as adults and they'll form wings and they'll fly off. The difference is a butterfly usually lives for about a month or so. Usually average aquatic insect adult only lives for about a day or so. So they, a lot of times as well, when they become adults, they don't have a mouth, they can't eat, they can't drink. So that aquatic insect is really the only purpose is to find a mate, lay eggs and die. The majority of their life is spent in the stream getting bigger and bigger and bigger for that one day. And that's why the water quality is so critical to their overall existence. Not only the water quality, but they're, if they're not there, they're the base of the food chain. So the fish and the reptiles and the amphibians and the other things are not gonna eat as well. So that's why these macroinvertebrates are so critical and that's why we're kind of looking at them. By looking at these critters, we can really determine the overall water quality of a particular section of stream. Like I said, some like really clean water, some prefer more polluted water, and still others can live in both clean and uh, dirty water. So by looking at these critters, we can tell a lot of what's going on in the stream. We typically do these assessments for macroinvertebrates twice a year, usually in the spring and the fall, to get a good representation of exactly what's going on in the stream. So the equipment you would need for a macroinvertebrate or a biological assessment is very, very easy. The biggest thing you would need would just be the, the kick net. And kick nets, or you can purchase those. We have some in our lab. Um, the, the, you can make them yourself with two broomsticks and, and uh, some screening from a window screening. Uh, the mesh size does need to be small enough to catch a lot of these small aquatic insects. Like I said, they're big enough to see with your naked eye, but they're, they, they're, not so, they're, they're also small enough that they can go through larger screens. So we want to make sure that we have a good sturdy net, usually one with a weight or something down here. And we'll talk about ones without weights and how do we do that so we don't lose critters underneath it. Other thing we would need is probably an ice cube tray or even an egg carton would work. And we'll talk about what those are used for. And a bucket is always helpful as well. It's not needed, but it does help in regards to getting some of that water and, and critters into it. 
So what you're gonna be doing when you go out to sample a stream is typically you're gonna go with numerous people. You typically do not wanna go by yourself, uh, just A, for safety reasons, but also there's, there's power numbers and the more people you have, the more folks you can actually help out. But the net is a sanction, so it's one meter by one meter is really what we're looking for. And what you wanna do is kind of lay this net down, uh, kind of an imaginary, so you kind of get a one meter section right above it and that's your sampling area. That's really where we want to get all our samples. We don't want to go way up here or other places. We want to face that net so it's facing upstream. So the flow is going down this way. And we're basically going to be clearing the rocks, the twigs, whatever's in this one meter section. And we're dislodging it from their happy home so it floats into the net and we can actually collect it and evaluate what's on it. So you're bending over, you're scraping off the rocks, you're brushing them, you're kicking them. And you're doing this from anywhere from one to three to five minutes in this one particular one meter section. We would do these kicks uh, two times each time at a different location. So this is one location we might do. The next location we might go over here. We never wanna go downstream for our second one because we could still have in, uh, macaron rivets floating down from our first kick. So if you're gonna be doing two kicks, you either do them side by side or you do one downstream first and then one upstream is really what it comes down to. But keeping in that one meter section, keeping the net facing upstream so everything's flowing into it and then your second sample going upstream or next to it is really the key things we're looking for here. This is what we don't wanna see. Um, obviously, this is way too far away. Yes, they might be getting a lot of macros in here or aquatic insects, but unfortunately, this is not the one square meter area. We want to be quality, but also quantity as well. So we want to have some sort of um, prerequisite or some kind of idea of exactly the area we're sampling. I think these folks had a good idea going up here, but unfortunately, that's way too much of an area. We just want a small little subset of what's actually in the stream. You can see he has brushes and some other things to kind of help him out. This is really what we're looking for is once again, volunteer holding the net kind of at a 45 degree angle, somebody one meter ahead of it, once again, kind of imaginary putting that net down in that one meter section. And he's he's got gloves on so he can pick rocks up, he can scrape it with his feet, he's in there dislodging that, kind of making it muddy. So all the aquatic insects are being dislodged and going right into the net. They're then taking that net over onto the bank and you can kind of see what they have here. They have little forceps, uh, they have little plastic spoons, and they're taking these aquatic insects and they're putting them into the ice cube trays and they're kind of separating them out by species. And we'll go over why we're doing that later. This is one technique you can use to evaluate or at least pick the things, pick the critters off the nets. Uh, another thing you can do is lay it on a table. These folks have this laid on a table. They're using egg cartons, but the same kind of concept. They're using plastic spoons or forceps to pick stuff up. Another thing you might wanna have with you is what this gentleman has is a water, water squirt bottle. When you take the critters out and put them on a dry surface like this, they sometimes freeze up. They're out of their habitat, they don't wanna move. So you spray them occasionally with water. It does kind of bring them back to life, kind of revives them a little bit, makes it easier for you to see them and pick them off and identify them. So one thing you might wanna have if you're gonna keep them in the dry like this is some kind of water bottle to keep them wet occasionally just to kind of spruce them up and to make sure they're still moving. The other thing you can do is you can collect everything into a bucket or a pan after your net, so you're washing all the net into a bucket or pan. And then you have a little pipette or forceps and you're pulling stuff out. This way they're in the water, you can see them moving around. It makes it a little bit harder to get them, I will tell you, just because they're moving in water now that they're, they're in their own environment. That's why the pipette comes in. But you, you can't do this as well. If you have a picnic table or a lab setting, this is an easier way to go about doing it um, compared to this. But both methods, both methods will work. Once again, you're looking to get all the aquatic insects or the majority off of them that different species that you have on those nets. When I talked about grouping, this is what I'm actually talking about. So in the ice cube tray, you're putting all of the same kind of macron vertebrate in that particular uh, area of the ice cube tray. Once again, we're not just looking for the species of the aquatic insects, we're also looking for the amount of that species because that's gonna play a factor in our evaluation process. So we're looking at how many of these mayflies do we have in here? Do we have less than five? Do we have more than 10? So we wanna do an evaluation of not just what we find, but how many we find of each one. And that really comes into the data sheet. So this is our data sheet for the Water Quality Volunteer Coalition, which has a date and a time and the names of people doing it along with the water body and some 
um, weather conditions. On the back side, then, is really what gets into the meat of the actual evaluation. We're looking at each of the three groups of macroinvertebrates, which we'll go over here shortly, sensitive, somewhat sensitive, and tolerant. So not just that they're present, but we're also looking for how many do we have? Do we have one to nine organisms? We're calling those rare, and we'll put an R next to the water penny. Or do we have 10 to 99 organisms? And those are common. Maybe we have uh, common scuds. We have more than, we have 50 of those, or a rough estimation. Or do we have a dominant? We have a D, 100 plus organisms. Maybe we have 100 sow bugs. We want to put a D there. Those will come into factor when we go down here, because each one of these is assigned a value. And we multiply that value by the number of R's, C's, and D's for each group. And we get a water quality score, which we then evaluate here as good, fair, or poor. So the idea is to really not just look at the species, but then also look at the number of organisms of that species in the different groups to get an overall water quality rating. This is what's called a, bio a biological index or a biotic index for a particular stream. There's a number of ways to do it. There's a low scale where low numbers mean better. This one is a high score means better. So there's different ways. This is how our water quality volunteer coalition uses it. And it's been fairly accurate. What you wanna do then is marry this information with your habitat assessment information along with your chemistry data as well to get an overall water quality score for a particular stream. So that's our water quality side of things. Now we can actually get into the macroinvertebrates and what we're looking for and the characteristics of them. And that's really what it comes down to when it comes to biological assessment. Because we're only doing these assessments twice a year in the spring and the fall, sometimes difficult to remember the characteristics and the, 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 the things that make them unique. So this is really what the screening is all about. And we, like I said, we, we divide these into three different groups. We have a sensitive group, a somewhat sensitive, and then a tolerant group. We also have a group called other. I just throw that in there just so you can see some other ones you might see while you're, excuse me, while you're sampling out there. And uh, just to give you an idea of some other critters that are out there that might be showing up in your net. So let's start with the group one sensitive critters. And we'll go through these, uh, each one. So you have a different characteristic you'll be looking for or a different idea. But I wanna caution everybody on these are somewhat, these are macroinvertebrates as, you, as we talked about. So they're big enough you can see with your naked eye. But for the, for the point of this presentation, we've enlarged these quite a bit and realize they're not gonna be this large when you get them on your tray, but we're looking for characteristics. So that's why we're really making them large. So you can look for some of these characteristics to kind of figure out some of these things when you get them in the net. So be, aware, be in mind that these are, these are overly enlarged, but just for their educational purposes. For instance, this is not how large a water penny is, okay? But why do we call it a water penny? Because it's round, it kind of has that same color as a penny. And why do I say that? Because if you look behind it, this, he's actually sitting on a penny. This is the Y in Liberty, and that is the water penny. Water pennies are actually beetles. In the beetle family, they're scrapers. They scrape algae off of rocks uh, and, and uh, leaves and twigs and whatever it might be. And they're not going to change in anything. This is what the water penny is always going to look like, but it's a very good water quality indicator. He needs a lot of that broken down leaf material to actually scrape off those rocks. Um, and they get very small and compact. When you take them into a net or put them into a net, they're going to look like broken down leaves. Once again, that's where that water bottle comes in. If you can spray them, they'll kind of revive them. They'll start moving around. You'll say, hey, why is that little leaf particle moving? Well, it's probably a water penny though. Okay. Very good indicator of water quality. Another one we have uh, that's a good water quality indicator, and the, actually the only one that can actually hurt you besides the crayfish is this guy called a Dobson fly or a Helgermite. Um, has six legs, three on each side, has these mandibles, and we'll look at those closer, with all these little appendages on the side. These can get anywhere from an inch to all the way to five or six inches I've seen them in length, so they can get quite large. And why are they sensitive to pollution? It's because they're gills. Their gills are exposed underneath their abdomen back here. So any kind of uh, pollution such as nutrients or especially sediment can actually clog these gills, which is not something that we wanna see. Obviously these are our water quality indicators for that reason. If these guys have polluted water, they cannot survive because their gills get clogged, okay? Uh, very good. So these guys also are voracious predators and that's why they have these big mandibles on them, okay? These are what can actually bite you if you pick them up. No venom, it just kind of pinches you and, and can cause a little bit of an irritation, okay? I will say that, but they are voracious predators. Typically when you find these guys underneath a rock, you're not gonna find too much other things because they've eaten everything. 
But if you go fishing, these are the kind of bait you want to use. Really big, juicy bait. A lot of fish like to eat these guys. The problem is you're kind of putting them on a hook. Here's a really good picture of a, a hugger mite eating actual stonefly. So you can kind of see the, the voracious predators they are. One thing I like to do with this is not just only show the aquatic version, but also what it looks like when it becomes an adult. Because remember, a lot of these turn into something later on in life. It might only be for a day or so, but you can want to see the adult. So this is what an adult dobson fly looks like. Those mandibles tongue almost turn like the tusks. They can still bite you then as well. And these guys is, is probably about five, six, maybe seven, eight inches in length. And they, they fly very, very poorly. They run into buildings and houses, almost like a small bird when they're flying around. But a very good indicator, if you see this guy, it's probably those Helger mites in the stream that they came off of. So I try to show these adult versions as well, just so you get a general idea, because maybe you're sampling, maybe not macros, but you're out the stream and you see these guys, that might be an indicator that you have Helger mites in your stream. Other things uh, that are sensitive to pollution, which are, are gilled snails. And we wanna look at these guys in a unique way. We want to put the apoculum up top here or the top of the snail up toward facing the sky. And then we want to see where the opening is. If the opening is on the right, that means it's a gilled snail. We're going to see later on a tolerant snail called the pouch snail where the opening is on the left. Gilled snails have the opening on the right. So you always want to look for where the opening is when that shell is pointed toward the top. If it's on the right, you're all right in regards to water quality. It's kind of a little saying we use. Okay, so that's going to be a gilled snail. Another one we're going to be looking for are riffle beetles. And riffle beetles, typically, we're going to see them as like adults. They're going to look like this. It, once again, this is blown up, but they'll look like small little ticks. And we call them riffle beetles because they like those fast running white water areas, those riffle areas where we're sampling. So typically, if you have good water quality, you're going to get quite a bit of riffle beetles. But don't be fooled. There's also larva. This is what it looks like before it becomes the adult. And this is what the larva look like, very hard exoskeleton with six legs. And if you find these, we're still categorizing those as riffle beetles. But once again, you're going to find them in the same location. Sometimes people will confuse these for caddis flies, but these are actually riffle beetles uh, for, for that reason. Speaking of caddis flies, there is a sensitive caddis flies, and these are called non-net spinning caddis flies. There's net spinning caddis flies and non-net spinning caddis flies. Net spinning caddis flies obviously make nets in the water and they're somewhat sensitive. Non, excuse me, yeah. Non-net spinning caddis flies do not make nets in the water. They actually glue things around themselves like rocks and twigs and things like that, almost like ballast to actually protect them. And they are sensitive to pollution. And they, depending on what kind of stream, depending on what kind of species, they will have different things that they're gluing around themselves. They're actually relative to the spider family. And they have the saliva that actually glues these things together and actually these, these cases protect them. And if you look real closely before you get into your stream to do your biological assessment, you can see a lot of these critters before you even disturb the water. So if you look down, you can see these little twigs kind of hanging on to logs or rocks. Those are typically caddis flies. If you look real closely, you'll see little legs popping out. Sometimes when you put these guys into a net, they will jettison this case and you won't know if it's a case building or a non-case building or a caddis fly. So that's why you look before you get in to see if you can see some of these, because sometimes they'll push these out when they leave. Here's a really good example where you can see just loaded case building caddis flies or non-net spinning ones, if you want to talk that. And all the little legs are kind of sticking out here. What they're doing is they're, they're filter feeders. They're grabbing things that they float downstream, broken down leaves, twigs, what's also called detritus. And they're eating that and they're filtering that into their little caves or little snail shells here, their cases, and that's what they're using. But you can see they're prolific. They'll be on top of each other. And depending on the substrate, they'll be these cases will be made out of different situations or different, excuse me, different materials. Once again, looking at the adult, <clears throat> the adult caddis fly holds its wings kind of like a pup tent right over the back of its body. So they're kind of shaped as a V on the back. We'll look at mayflies and stoneflies, which hold their, their wings much differently. So once again, looking for adults, maybe when you're out there, might have an indicator of maybe if you have case, if you have uh, caddis flies in your stream. Probably the one that most people know about is the mayfly. Uh, mayfly is a very good water quality indicator, but there's way to determine what kind of mayfly you have, but also if it is a mayfly. The two distinguishing characteristics, uh, how many letters in the word may, there's three. Typically, I say typically, there's usually three tails on a mayfly. Three tails on a mayfly, three tails on a mayfly. It's not always the case, but 
that usually that's the situation. So that's a good indicator. The other one that's really a little bit more important would be where are the gills and can you see them? The gills on the mayfly are usually back here in the abdomen. You can kind of see them fluttering. Same here with this one. You can see the gills in the abdomen. Same here on these, you can see the gills. So if you have gills on the abdomen, you can see, and then three tails, you have a pretty good indication of mayflies. Mayflies come in all different shapes and sizes, but they're, they're like a fat head, excuse me, a flat head mayfly like this, the heptogeneity, which is very streamlined and aerodynamic, or a burrowing mayfly like this one, which burrows into the sediment, or even a small minnow mayfly like this. They all three have those characteristics and all mayflies are gonna have that of the abdomen gills and the three tails. So that's what you wanna be looking for when you're evaluating whether you have a mayfly or not. I throw this picture up because sometimes they'll molt and they'll get a whitish color. So you can't always use color as indicator. Once again, where are the gills and how many tails does it have? Uh, once again, very streamlined in our approach. They sometimes can be cannibalistic. So they will eat their own young, but they kind of hold on to the rocks and the twigs and the bottom of the stream, and they're scraping algae and broken down leaves and twigs off of that. So voracious kind of uh, filter, not filter feeders, but maybe scrapers is really what they're all about. The adult mayfly is very unique, and probably most people have seen those, especially fly fishermen. They hold their wings directly above their head, right above. So pup tent for the caddisflies, directly above their head for the mayflies, Good indicator of, of uh, mayflies. Mayflies are also their scientific name is ephemeral or ephemeroptera, which is basically short-lived, meaning they only live about a day as an adult. So a very short adult life stage, but they come off in such great numbers. In some locations, people have to shovel streets and bridges of their dead carcasses because they're coming off in such great numbers and a lot of things like to eat them. So mayflies are a very important food source, not only for terrestrial, but also for aquatic life as well. Kind of another one that's sometimes get confused with stonefly, and we can and narrow that confusion down a little bit here, would be the stonefly. So stoneflies and mayflies get, sometimes get confused. But once again, what are we looking for? The mayflies had their gills back here. You can see them, and they had three tails. Well, this one, I don't see gills here. The gills are actually underneath the thorax here, and we'll look at those later. And the tails is typically two tails. So this would be an indicator this is a stonefly. This is a common stonefly called a perlid. Very pretty, you could about an inch or so in length. Um, very good water quality indicator. It's clean, cold, cold running, clear, crisp, cold running water. And once again, these guys come in all shapes and sizes from very small, like a winter stone fly. You can see the penny there to a pelted pearl a day, which is almost like a roach like stone, stone fly to another type. But once again, all they have in common is two tails. See the two tails and no abdomen gills. The gills are underneath the thorax. Once again, Good indicator of a stonefly or mayfly, you're looking for those kind of things. These are kind of cool. These are giant stoneflies called pteranarsids. These guys can get two to three inches in length and they actually live on leaf packs because they're breaking down leaves and twigs. And they will actually be uh, very large in size and, and can sometimes startle people, but an excellent food source and a good indicator of really good water quality. And why are these guys such indicators of good water quality? Well, look where their gills are. Their gills are right underneath their thorax and they're very exposed, just like that helgramite. So if sediment comes down and gets in those gills, it'll actually pollute it and actually kill it off. So these guys are very sensitive to nutrients and especially sediment pollutions. They need nice, clear, cold running water. We actually, these guys, if you put them in a pan of water, they don't have enough oxygen. They will actually do push-ups in that pan to get more oxygen. So they need lots of lots of oxygen and clear, cold water. So these are really good indicators of a good water quality if you have stone flies. Once again, the adults, uh, different from the mayfly, don't hold it over their head, like a caddisfly, like a pop tent, they actually fold their wings right over their back, uh, evenly over their back. So a good indication of if you have a stone fly. So those are the sensitive aquatic insects. Those are the ones we want to find in our stream in good numbers because that means we have good water quality. The next in the line is somewhat sensitive, which means they can handle some pollution, but um, they, they can also handle some clean water as well. So they're kind of middle of the range and we'll go through these. So damselflies first on the list. A lot of people get confused with damselflies because they automatically see the three tails right here and they use that as the only indication as it being a mayfly. But once again, what were the two characteristics for a mayfly? Three tails and gills on the abdomen. Well, I don't have any gills in the abdomen. 
So this is not a mayfly, it is actually a damselfly. The gills are actually the tails. Look how wide these gills are. Once again, there's this one lost its third tail, but these are the gills of the damselfly. Damselflies are voracious predators. They're relatives of the dragonfly. They will live in a stream three or four years, get bigger as an adult. They actually live for two weeks. They actually live a little bit longer as an adult. But we want to look at, once again, what they look like and, and their characteristics in the water. Good characteristic for them is they how they shed their skeleton. Uh, they basically go into vegetation. They'll break the back of their back here, and they'll shed their skeleton, and they'll form wings and fly off. And we've all seen damselflies as adults. These little iridescent uh, critters that kind of fly around with their wings directly above them. Beautiful creatures that fly around, mostly in lymphic systems or slow-moving systems. They can be found in lothic systems like streams and rivers, but um, a lot of times they're in both environments. But once again, you're looking at the characteristics of the tails, but also the where the gills are as well. I throw alderflies in here. We don't see too many alderflies in Pennsylvania and Lancaster County, but they are a species very similar to Dobson fly or Helgramite, where they have six legs, kind of the appendages on the side, and they have a single tail going behind them, kind of a somewhat sensitive critter, critter, but we don't see too many of those, just like we don't see the adults as well. But I wanted to throw that up because occasionally they, they will pop up in, in Lancaster County. The ones we see quite a bit in, in, are these guys called scuds. We've also called them freshwater shrimp or side swimmers. Um, these are uh, prolific in spring-fed streams, springs that have come out of limestone areas, um, springs like Lidded Springs, Big Springs, Donegal Springs, because they like hard water, they like limestone, all the ions that are in there, and, and the watercrest and those kind of things that grow in there. That is an ideal situation for these guys. They don't turn in anything. They're a huge protein source for uh, fish and for amphibians and other things in the stream, but they come in those streams in such great numbers. They're almost like polluted with all these scuds and other species we'll see later. So a good indicator, you have cold water and a, a limestone spring or a hard water stream if you find these guys in it. And they come in different shapes and colors and sizes. Sometimes they'll have this orange tint to them, almost like a, a shrimp would. Um, but yeah, we, we look for those when we go for uh, streams uh, with springs in them. Relatives of the damselfly would be the dragonfly. The dragonflies are more robust and round. They're also voracious predators as well. They have a mouth that extends about a third of their body out. They kind of ambush predators. They'll kind of sit there and wait for their prey to swim by. And they'll put, put their mouth out and grab it and bring it back in. Also, their gills are actually back here on their butt. And the cool thing is they actually take in water through this and put it in their abdomen and they can actually shoot it out like a giant fart. That's how kids like to hear that. And they can actually shoot across the water very, very quickly by doing that. So it's an escape mechanism for them. So dragonflies are in streams, but they're also in ponds and lakes and slower moving systems as well. We've all seen dragonflies adults. Um, they're, they're very pretty, very iridescent. Um, unlike the old wives' tail, they do not sting us, um, but all different shapes and sizes. They actually live for about two weeks as an adult, which is great for us because in that time, they eat lots and lots of mosquitoes. So you want to keep them around as much as possible. So dragonflies is a somewhat sensitive critter. <clears throat> Another one that you guys have probably all seen is a cranefly. Craneflies are these uh, look like large mosquitoes with big long legs in the summertime hanging around your lights. Do not kill them. Uh, crane flies are vegetarians for the most part. They do not have a mouth when they become adults. They can't eat. Their only point is to find a mate, lay eggs, and die. But because we think they're mosquitoes, we kill them. But when they're in the stream, they kind of look like this, little grubs, um, almost like little worms. Um, they're actually vegetarians. They'll actually burrow into leaf packs into a stream when the leaves all fall in the fall. And they'll actually eat their way out, and that's their food source for the entire winter. And then the spring, they're ready to emerge. If you get these guys, you actually hold them up to the light. You can actually see the fly he's going to become when he emerges in the spring or summer. And this is what they look like. Like I said, look like a giant mosquito. Do not kill them. They can't bite you. But because in our society, we're concerned about West Nile and other uh, pathogens, we do kill these. But unfortunately, um, they will not hurt. Excuse me. Fortunately, they will not hurt us. So we had non-net spinning caddisflies in the sensitive category, but we also have net spinning caddisflies, and they're in a somewhat sensitive. And these varieties are very prolific. You're gonna see them almost in every stream. And like the, the name said, they do not have a case around them. They spin nets. 
like I said, they're relative to the spider family. And in that net, they catch broken down leaves and twigs. And you're kind of thinking, well, how do they hold themselves in place? You can kind of see these little hooks right here. I'll blow it up. This is really how they hold on to rocks and twigs and everything else along with their nets. So really, really good at holding on to the stream. These guys also have what's called a pupa stage. So there's a stage for about two weeks right before they become adults where they go into a pupa stage, almost like a cocoon, like a caterpillar would. And they kind of look in this little seed pod. If you would collect these, you would still mark these down as caddis flies. You'd mark them down as uh, net spinning caddis flies because of that, the pupa stage. Even though they're not doing anything for two weeks, it is a caddis fly and will be emerging as a caddis fly at some point. Here's a really good view of their nets when they're all blown up and what they look like. Once again, they're catching broken down leaves and twigs and detritus that actually flow into those areas. And here's a really good picture of them kind of embedded in those to kind of catch that food source. Becoming greens and grays and browns and tans is typically what you're looking for. And how you can determine if they're not a, a, a case building caddis fly, usually a case building has a bump up here around their, their third thorax up here. And actually to hold in their case, like I said, when we collect those, they kind of jettison their case. You can't tell if they're a case building or not. But if, once again, if you're looking in the screen beforehand, you can see the nets in there and you can see them very well protected and, and in those streams. So when you get those, a pretty good indicator you have net spinning caddis flies. Once again, uh, pop tent is the adult version kind of right over their back. And that's a good indication of what you have there. Just like the scud, the other one that you find in limestone are really hard water streams and spring streams or sow bugs. We used to call these roly polies or pill bugs, you might have called them. They're terrestrial versions you guys might have played with when you were younger, picking up logs and stuff like that. There's also an aquatic versions. They don't change in anything. They're, they're uh, an isopod. They live in the stream. They're a hard exoskeleton. But if you have lots and lots of hard water, spring-fed water, uh, spring-fed water, these guys will be in there with the scuds. Another excellent protein source for the fish. They'll just take those and eat those all day. They're usually going to be on the water crest and other things vegetation-wise in the stream. So good indication you have nice cold water there. This one is a somewhat sensitive one, but also has other implications. So if you look at the nail on your pinky finger, that's the size of our native fingernail clams. They should be about that size. The bottom right one here is an Asian clam. Asian clams are probably larger than the size of your, your uh, pinky nail, and they actually will outcompete our fingernail clams and actually push them out. And there's nothing that actually eats these Asian clams, so they can be problematic or an invasive species. You know, say, how did an Asian clam come here to Lancaster County? Well, when you get your things from Southeast Asia or Asia, they come on a boat and that boat takes on ballast water. In that ballast water are usually these Asian clams. When those bo boats port in Baltimore, Philly, New York, these guys come dislodged and then they attach themselves to ducks feet and, and geese feet. And actually as they migrate back and forth, these guys come dislodged. These aren't as bad as zebra mussels, but they can push out our native clams. So they can be problematic. They're kind of a double-edged sword because they push out our native clams, but at the same time, they do filter the water. So because nothing eats them, it's not a species you want to see, but it is something you could see out there when you're doing sampling. They are almost every stream. It's just a matter of how many species are in there. And then finally, the somewhat sensitive are crayfish. I think everybody has seen a crayfish. It's not a macro invertebrate, but we still put it in here just because it is things that we get. Kind of unique characteristics, the crayfish, uh, crayfish swims backwards. Why is that? because his tail has his gills. So if you flip his tail, that's what he does. That gives him more oxygen. Just like when you run and you pant, it's the same kind of concept. Um, cool thing you can do with a crayfish, you can actually put a little bit of food coloring underneath his tail and the food coloring actually come out of his mouth like he's smoking. Cool thing for kids to see. Also crayfish can do fierce battles in the stream for prime habitat for food and they'll lose their claw doing that. So they'll have one or two claws, maybe one claw is big. They actually can regenerate their claws, which is very, very unique. Finally, the thing that always kids like is when we talk about where's the butt on the crayfish, it's actually right underneath his mouth. Anything can have the butt, he actually re-eat. So cool fact about the crayfish and, and uh, something that kids always like to hear. So those were our somewhat sensitive macros. Let's talk about now our tolerant ones. These are the ones that can tolerate pollution. They could care less whether it's dirty or clean water. Just give them the water and they'll take off. 
aquatic worms. Why do you go fishing with worms? Because there's worms in the stream, whether it be thread worms, whether it be round worms. As you would suspect, they live in sediment areas. They don't really care about too much other things. They don't care about warm water, cold water, sediment, nutrients. They don't really care. So that's why they're tolerant of pollution. Another one would be the planaria. Uh, flatworm, you guys might have heard that before. Very flat, kind of relative to the leech family. They're not parasitic, but they're, they're not the best to find in your stream. Cool thing with these guys, you can actually cut them right down the middle on both halves or regenerate. They're hermaphrodites, so they can do that. Uh, kind of unique in the, in the uh, planaria world. Black fly is kind of an interesting creature and very important to Pennsylvania. So black flies have a row of hooks at the base of their, their butt back here and they anchor their butt to the bottom of the stream and they'll sway back and forth and they'll use these tentacles up here to grab broken down leaves and twigs or filter feeders. They also have a small piece of thread that actually comes out. So if these hooks ever come dislodged, that thread actually holds them back. It's almost like a tether and actually pull themselves back onto that rock if they ever come dislodged. But they're basically swaying in the water back and forth with these filter fans up here, grabbing broken down leaves and twigs. But why they're unique to Pennsylvania in regards to how we control them is because of the female. This is the female black fly, and she needs a blood meal before she lays her eggs. And the blood meal just happens to be us as humans. So black fly uh, suppression in Pennsylvania is very, very big. In fact, black fly suppression program in Pennsylvania is the second largest program in the, in the entire world. Only the continent of Africa sprays to kill black flies more than the state of Pennsylvania. I will say that again, only the continent of Africa sprays our waters more than Pennsylvania to kill these guys because they do carry diseases like West Nile virus, African sleeping sickness, malaria. And because Pennsylvania has 86,000 miles of stream, these can be quite problematic. If you go to other states, you'll notice they do not spray for black flies or they have a less program, especially in the Northeast and New England in Canada, because you go up camping up there, you, black flies are everywhere and they will get bit by black flies. But in the springtime, you will see helicopters going over streams and creeks in Pennsylvania just to put a biological agent down to kill black flies. So kind of unique situation in Pennsylvania for the black fly and what we're doing with it. Midge is another one you're going to see in every stream in Pennsylvania and Lancaster County. Midges are sometimes called gnats when they become adults, are small little worms that are actually living in the stream, kind of wiggling back and forth, almost like nematodes. Most of the time they're clear like this, but sometimes they're also red. When they're red like this, they're called blood worms. They do not suck our blood. What it is, is they have hemoglobin in them. Same thing we have in our blood allows them to live in areas with low dissolved oxygen. So uh, areas where other critters cannot. So sediment rich, nutrient rich areas where there's probably not too many other critters living except for these guys. But they come off in such great numbers. It's just, it's mind numbing at times. This is a, a midge hatch on the Conestoga River. And you can kind of just see all those midges there. Great food source for fish and others, but um, not the best for water quality when we see those. Then finally, we have the leech. Uh, I think everybody knows what the leech is. It's a parasite. It'll suck on to its host and, and basically suck the blood. They will attach themselves to, to humans. Uh, the issue here in, in Pennsylvania, they will not suck our blood if they attach them. They, they can't pierce our skin. The ones down south, uh, that species down south, Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, they can actually suck our, their, pierce our skin. So, But the ones we have in Pennsylvania are not, but Obviously, leeches are not a good water quality indicator, but we want to find they are tolerant of pollution. So we want to make sure we don't see too many of those guys. And then we have the pout snail. We had the gill snail earlier. Remember the opening, if you face the, the top of the snail upwards, was on the right. Now the opening is on the left. So that's a pouch snail. So once again, pout snails are not the best for water quality. They're tolerant for pollution, which means we don't want to find those. We want to find the opening on the right, which means they're gill snails. So those were the different characteristics, excuse me, the different categories of the aquatic insects. But I also wanna show you some other neat aquatic insects, just because like I said, you might see these when you're out sampling and some neat characteristics. So uh, one that's kind of neat is the predaceous diving beetle. Predaceous diving beetle is just that, it's a diving beetle. Hopefully we all heard of scuba diving, actually predaceous diving beetles embed scuba diving. They can grab a small little air bubble, probably uh, the size you can fit in between your two fingers, 
and they can strap it to their belly using these hairs on their legs. You can see that. And they actually dive down the bottom of the stream, that small little air bubble for about 20 to 30 minutes and actually uh, look for food on the bottom of the stream. So they've actually invented scuba diving before humans did, kind of very unique characteristic. And they are predaceous, obviously, with the name they have. <coughs> Excuse me. Whirligig beetles, another type of beetle that's out there You'll really see these in the surface of the water. They move very, very quickly, uh, usually in groups like this, um, very hard to catch. Um, once again, really not indicators of water quality because they're breathing the same oxygen we are. They can move quite a bit around. Uh, if you do pick them up, just be careful. They do have a very powerful scent gland and uh, they can smell quite bad when you pick them up, but usually you'll see them on the top of the water. Ones you see more in a lenthic system or a slow moving system like swamps or ponds or wetlands would be a back swimmer, usually very prolific red eyes and they swim upside down. Um, and and uh, they swim in these areas looking for uh, other critters. Not to be confused with another lenthic critter called the water boatman, which swims upright, which has these big oars on either side. And uh, they are very similar. So you can see this guy is a back swimmer swims upside down where the water boatman swims right side up. Typically, you're not gonna find these in stream environments. You're gonna find these more in wetland ponds, but I just wanna throw them out there because occasionally they might pop up. Ones you see in, in both environments would be the water strider. It's not a spider, it's a water strider. They use the surface tension of the water to basically get around and also to sense vibrations to find food and other things. Um, very, very common thing. Once again, breathing the same oxygen we are, so really can't determine water quality from them too easily. A neat one we have here in, in Pennsylvania and actually throughout the world is the giant water bug. So the one we have here in Pennsylvania maybe gets about an inch or two uh, big. They have some in South America that can get six or seven or eight inches in length. Uh, water bugs, once again, are typically in lenthic systems, wetlands, ponds. But what's unique about these guys is the female lays the eggs on the back of the male, and it's then his job to protect those eggs till his death, basically, um, until they hatch. So his, his job is really for the protection of those. So they live in the, the reeds or the weeds of the wetland or pond and uh, basically wait until they hatch and, and they'll, they'll be good to go to that. And the one that I really enjoy, and, and we sometimes see in stream environments, is a water scorpion. If you've ever seen a walking stick, he's very similar to a walking stick, um, but you don't see these too often. They're specific species <clears throat> just for uh, Lancaster County and Pennsylvania. So what's unique about them is they actually pierce the, the water surface with this long kind of appendage at the base of their, their, their hind end, and that's how they breathe. What I'm more interested in is this, the head, where they have their head, which is more of a piercer, they call it a piercing macroinvertebrate, meaning they pierce their prey. So typically their prey would be a small fish or a tadpole. And what they do is they stab their prey in the head with this piercer, and then they release digestive enzymes into their prey that turn the inside of that critter into a slushy and then suck it back out through their straw head. So very, very unique adaptation that they've adapted to living in the water environment. Um, they don't, we can't pierce our skin, nobody turns into a slushy from our volunteers, but it is kind of a unique adaptation that water striders have that other ones do not. So we've talked about a lot of these macroinvertebrates and you have my contact information there if you have more questions, but we, we really need to look at these guys even further just because there are very good indicators of water quality, whether it be you find bad ones or good ones, or maybe even the middle of the road ones. We can really tell a lot just by looking at these critters. Yes, you can do chemistry and yes, you can do habitat assessments, but these aquatic insects are, are doing a lot of our, our heavy lifting and telling us a lot of the, the biological information that we're looking for in regards to a stream's water quality. So by looking at these guys, we can really tell a lot. So that's why our volunteers are going out there. And that's why DEP and other federal agencies are using these macros to actually study and get water quality standards by looking at these critters. So what I would encourage you to go out there and uh, use some of these characteristics and, and techniques to study the streams and, and use these uh, this, this webinar as kind of a, a building block to build off. There's all sorts of apps and, and programs out there, but this is a good way to, to check overall water quality. Thank you for your time.